Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. Sorry about a late start. We're back here. It is August 16th. <coughs> a lot of news coming around. Uh, the debris cleanup is happening in full force, and they're cleaning up most of the Franklin to the Fort neighborhoods, including some of the areas in Slant Streets, uh, also near River Road, areas of media adjacent to those neighborhoods as well. This week is what they're going to be working on, and a lot of them saying are also saying that from all the damages, according to reports, uh, the urban forestry uh, department here in Missoula is about 40,000 trees were affected by the, the storms that happened on uh, July 24th with winds as high as 109 uh, uh, miles per hour. So there's a lot of stuff that going on like that. Not to mention the state of emergency that Greg Gianforte put into effect on July 25th uh, helped open up federal aid with the $3.8 million in damages for the city of Missoula. If you're interested in, um, or if you want to report any down trees, you can go to Missoula.co, that's uh, Missoula.co slash four, the number, and then S, to report any and all down trees, uh, Missoula.co slash four S. So those are the website you can go to. Also, you can uh, find out more information about this by going to Missoula.co slash storm, and the debris drop-off sites so far are Garden City Compost, Large Monch Triangle, um, Northside City Lot, uh, and if you cannot haul debris, you can call the number 406-201-1173. Again, that number is 201-1173. All of the debris collection should be separated from your trash to save time on staff separating those items for you. So that's some information right there. And um, let's jump right into some city council as they're talking about the budget season is happening. And so far, the city hosted a three hour meeting, meeting last week, which went over the overview of the budget and departments to facilities and more. The meeting was about four hours uh, as the city budget is a kind of a copy and paste of last year's budget with typical services like police, firefighters and over 800 city employees are being represented. Um, for the most part, I'm going to just go into a little bit more detail. So they talked about Parks District 1. Uh, Road District 1, Tourism Business Improvement District, Bu the Business Improvement District, um, the Permissive Medical Levy, and, uh, so this is an Employee Health Insurance Levy, uh, the Missoula Local Government Building Special uh, District Work Plan and Budget for Fiscal Year. This, so this is the uh, John Agin Government Building that the, both the county and the city are going to be going towards. And another item is the Emergency Budget Item Highlighting Sheltering to Help Budget for the Year long shelter that was only funded through the end of August. This item was discussed on Wednesday's committee meeting, but speaking of shelter, Mayor Andrea Davis talks about how the city and parks department are gonna be working towards the eight to eight memorandum for overnight camping in parks. And so this is what Mayor Andrea Davis had to say about that. Legally allow those that are houseless or folks living unsheltered to be able to uh, sleep outdoors legally in Missoula. And that is because we do recognize that folks have um, often a challenge um, when they are houseless being able to access shelter or whether we have enough shelter. Um, and, and so there's two things that we've been able to roll out immediately. Um, for the implementation of this ordinance. One is we have um, deployed the mandate in the ordinance, which is to allow for uh, safe sheltering in uh, public parks, almost all public parks, but not all. And by all public parks, it usually tends to be the ones with amenities nearby, like uh, uh, um, toilets, trash pickups, trash cleanup. Um, uh, they mapped out the areas for folks and library and other public places. Ms. will have that information for these folks looking for places to legally camp. However, the resolution and permanence are strong with the ordinance, which only covers to an 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. time frame, uh, which doesn't also include people who uh, don't have options to go to the shelters. And what I mean by that is that if you haven't tried to go into the shelters or anything like that, a lot of times you'll be pointed in that direction as a result, but if you've already done that and you've already been through that process of going to the POV or the Johnson Street Shelter, um, then you would be allowed to be on it. So it's, it's very small uh, uh, loophole for a lot of people being able to shelter in these areas. And overall, this will allow the city to place additional amenities to combat trash and cleanup. Uh, they're getting a little bit more proactive on this as well. And overall, the city is using resources to encourage and detour long-term camping while also not preventing it altogether. 
Also, don't waste the city's time with 911 to, uh, and contact the outreach teams through the POV if homeless loitering remains. So this is homeless loitering. Some people have a tendency to be like, oh, oh, and then it's always important to kind of have those kind of people to talk to and have people who are willing to talk to these people at their level. And so the hot teams, the uh, homeless outreach teams, number is 406. Uh, 493-7955. Again, that number is 493-7955, and they want you to contact these folks for the uh, sake of people who are homeless in that area who need that kind of additional help without calling 911. So let's get back into the budget. Park District 1 and Road District 1 are getting $10 million each in the budget, which is typical of the continued efforts in those departments. Mayor Davis talks about the emergency levy that helped shelter the funds for these sheltering areas. As I mentioned, in FY24, Mayor Hess declared an emergent, uh, emergency housing levy, and um, I am proposing that we move forward with that, and that um, emergency levy will need to uh, be voted on separately by council, so um, City Attorney Sudbury will be going through that detail on Wednesday when we have our budget presentation. Um, the intention for that is it will free up additional ARPA dollars that we will spend on uh, other initiatives that are in the mayor's budget, um, specifically the Johnson Street Shelter. Um, and then we also are moving some of the ARPA funds to our community planning, development, and innovation requests. And specifically, those are two positions that are funded one time only. Yep. And the, one of the big, bigger issues with the ARPA funds now is that by 2025, if the funds aren't being used or directed to a certain uh, uh, um, action, uh, moving forward, then they will not be uh, available. So by 2025, if you can't, it, the whole idea is that that money's there, but by 2025, if you don't have a plan for the any additional money that you may or may not have at that time, then that money will not carry over past 2025. So that's one of the things, and grants can be tricky business. Once you lose them, you either can try again, and in this case, you really can't, or try for something different, and the city is on the verge of something different. Since many of the ARPA money, American Rescue Plan money, that was slated to sunset by 2025. But that only means the, the intent not prevent money from having long-term impacts. So the tax increase was originally slated for 5.97% but we're able to crunch it down to about 5.84%, and overall the passage of the budget will happen next Monday, August 19th, for any additional amendments and alterations to the budget. This isn't the time for many major changes to the budget, but we'll have opportunity to go onto an existing proposal for any last minute changes. So they're already in this, any kind of amendments get changed. It's mostly about cutting out the fat, but when it comes down to the core of the budget, it will, uh, most of it will be moving forward and it's mostly to keep the lights on and the people and the 800 employees that are under the city uh, government paid as well. So um, before I get into my next subject, I'm gonna actually skip ahead to Wednesday's meeting because it talked a little bit more about the emergency sheltering deal. And so this is for Budget and Finance Committee, the proposed emergency levy would collect two mills or $414,009. The mill would cost a home assessed at $450,000, about $12 a year. These are because the shelters cannot keep up with the number of homeless, which resulted in urban camp and even more money for outreach, outreach and cleanup for the ordinance that successfully banned camping in parks 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. week uh, and also waterways permanently. So Mayor uh, Davis talks a little bit more about this emergency levy, which she did on Wednesday. We only have a certain number of tools to basically assess levies and generate um, property tax revenue to operate the city. The emergency mill levy, because emergency proclamation was made, we do have the option of assessing these two mills, which is approximately $409,000. It's a one-time tax increase. If it does not pass on the 19th by council, then um, there is a proposal to make a, a motion, uh, amend the motion to maximize basically our mill cap by that same two mills. So right now what we're doing is we are not proposing using two mills of our mill cap, which is a permanent tax increase. Um, and that way, um, you know, again, I think it's it's uh, one of the ways in which we are trying to be responsive to ongoing needs around increases in property taxes. And so um, if it does not, if the emergency mill levy does not pass, then we will be requesting that we utilize the, the two mills um, in order to um, pay for the, the uh, 
expenses associated with the budget. Either way, whether it's the emergency mill cap, mill levy that's used, or we use the mills from our mill cap, the amount we are projecting for a total tax increase is 5.85%. That is inclusive of the fire levy, that is inclusive of the general fund, the park district, and the road district. All right, and so there's kind of like the overview of how much uh, money is going to be towards this moving forward in their uh, efforts to uh, combat the uh, crisis that is homelessness in the city of Missoula. And like I say all the time, and I'll say it again, uh, reduce cost of living, I uh, mean, Wages haven't really gone up. Um, if they and if they and, they, and then when they did, um, the other inflation definitely uh, caught up, if not more so. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyways, that's just my opinion moving forward. And uh, and let's go over to a ne new topic, which um, you know the thing about uh, homelessness and everything like that it was affordable housing, and so trying to increase the housing stock. So there is a major subdivision being proposed in East Missoula, just off the bank of Clark Cork River, just as you're getting into East Missoula, right as you cross the uh, interstate. Um, there's a riverside open area, a lot of acreage for folks, a lot of potential, and Dave DeGrandpe with the CPDI talks more about this property and the future annexation of this particular property since it's not technically within the city limits. In the past, when properties have been developed in the county and then ultimately annexed into the city, there have been substandard uh, substandard infrastructure, streets, sidewalks, roads, things like that. And so it's very expensive to retrofit development once it's already in place. And so our logic in, in recommending annexation to the developer is that we can try to make sure that the, uh, the infrastructure is built according to city standards at the outset so those problems don't emerge in the future. Okay. And so you can kind of see here, Speedway, Highway 200, this uh, star spot right here is where they're pr doing the proposal. This is the highway. And imagine you're coming from Missoula, which is generally right about here. You drive up here, you go through the underpass, and you're just in this general area, and that's the proposed site. I'm sorry that if it's not as clear, but I'll have more uh, examples moving forward, along with uh, regardless how you feel about annexing East Missoula, an agreement for the 2034 annexation was put into place in these areas years ago. Infrastructure was the biggest challenge for this area, so much that even Bonner said they'd be annexed long before East Missoula because of the lack of water sewer options that they have there. Uh, Dave DeGrandpe also talks about the plans for this particular site and th what the rezoning means for this area. RT 5.4 is intended to fit with many already established residential neighborhoods and acknowledge the single dwelling residential building type as the primary use with the potential for accessory dwelling units as well. Um, and incidentally, the county growth policy or land use element for this area also provides a residential land use designation. The current zoning within the county is residential, so it's R residential is the official name of it. Um, and it also provides for a range of small scale housing options that reflect the traditional neighborhood uh, character of existing neighborhoods with the intent of promoting compatible infill development and housing diversity. Okay, and so as you heard that last part was infill diversity. The whole idea is that they're gonna have more high density uh, building in that area that also transitions more into a more suburban area. So uh, if you've known about new construction, Missoula's architecture expect more of the same. However, folks in the area do not have uh, uh, the, uh, so let's see, where, where, where was I going with this? Uh, so 406 Engineering presented the Aspire uh, development. They gave a rendered look at the housing they plan to build. And uh, Representative uh, Brian uh, uh, Throckmorton talks a little bit more about this from the 406 Engineering. So without further ado, here is a little bit of, of, of a taste of what you guys can expect from this site. So th this is an example of you know what it would look like transitioning between the single family and then on the right hand side of the picture would be the multifamily. So you can kind of get a look at what, what this community would look like. Um, again, Dave kind of hit on the proposed area. Again, more of an infill type project versus out there off of Mullen Road or 44 Ranch or we, you know Remington Flats, any of that is, is kind of on the edge of development. One thing that's nice, I haven't done a major subdivision this big yet that actually has the bus that can go to it. We talk about it all the time. We talk about it out of, towards 44 Ranch, um, you know, anything that direction. But this project actually has a bus stop next to it, 
and in discussions with Mountain Lion, we would be able to probably change the bus route to come through the subdivision. So that's a, something that shows how infill this is versus anywhere else that we've, we've worked before. And so this is a major uh, subdivision that they're planning to rezone and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of information being um, uh, thrown at the city and Brian gave examples of multi-dwelling versus the single dwelling that they're proposed for this area. And so far the single uh, family and duplexes with a 7.1 dwelling unit per acre as the middle ground that they've uh, discussed for how they're going to grow this uh, particular part of the city. And this is what Brian uh, Throckmorton had to say in continuance to what he, uh, the organization plans to build on this site. So we propose five plexes and 10 plexes. This is what the five plex would look like. Um, so this is the housing in the front where we, you know, Dave talked about the variance or the front doors and the, and the, all the front going to the variance with the walkway. The back is actually garages for parking in the back. And then the 10 plexes are basically two five plexes put together. So you'll have a cottage court in the front where people will walk out of their front doors and see somebody else's front door. The backs will be an alley on that to allow for just cars to, to more go to parking versus a through street. So this is a rendering of what that would look like. Here would be an example of right across the street that we looked at from the multifamily. This would be the densest uh, single family housing with, within the subdivision. Doesn't have any, any uh, 50 wide foot live lots on here, only the 30 foot, 38 foot. So you can see that there's a tree per lot and you can see it's still a, a nice neighborhood. Okay, so there's the kind of the example of what you guys can expect that they want to propose and want to build on this place and details and more details, but I'll spare you since the pictures kind of show you an idea of what you can expect. And Dave Sanson, representing the developer and some of the residents in East Missoula has this to say about this project. As, uh, as you've seen, we started in the county uh, with this and uh, we impact the majority of the citizens here tonight are all county residents. And what we wanted to do, our company motto is building a better community. What we've focused on is building more attainable or workforce housing. Um, affordable is, is kind of a misnomer uh, in today's day and age. A lot of the affordability issues throughout the country and certainly in Missoula is based on supply. It's a supply and demand issue. And as, as Dave indicated, the, the county's criteria based on your growth plan is a minimum of a thousand units a year. And you can see just in the last couple of years, it's continued to go down. And the majority of the product that's being supplied is all rental. Okay. You know, he, he, he nailed that right on the head that most of the things that have been built recently have only been able to be rentals because the cost of uh, basically buying a house or buying a place in Missoula has gone uh, definitely out of hand in terms of pricing. Um, Richard Fifield, a uh, resident of East Missoula, spoke out against the development and the government's lack of communication on this matter. Um, it feels as though that it was kind of rushed. We had two planning board meetings it's unprecedented and the only common denominator is that we don't have a vote on anything we have no representation you decide our utility rates you're our water company but we don't get to vote for city council members we don't get to vote for the mayor so i ask that you really reconsider our 25 year long marriage <laughs> And think about maybe it's time to renegotiate the deal because it ain't working for some of us. Yep. And so that's just one of the many things about having those kind of small communities that are so close to the city of Missoula is that they're not part of the city and yet they're being um, um, developed on through the city and county efforts. Um, I mentioned this uh, because the city uh, has in the past created a rude awakening for some neighborhoods and density and higher traffic is another issue that these folks mentioned during the public comment portion of this. This is one of those uh, uh, county areas that Missoula County has control over and the city has taken over for the future plans of annexation, which is why they're a big part of the city as they're working on these plans moving forward. And Sue Holden, East Missoula resident, gave comment as well on this. We know that development is inevitable in East Missoula. A subdivision of this size and magnitude is not appropriate for East Missoula. The definition of character overlay is based on the city of Missoula. 
It definitely does not fit the true and actual character of the neighborhood in East Missoula County. Annexing that property into the city of Missoula along with rezoning, I feel is a manipulative tactic to avoid the Missoula County zoning laws at best. Currently, there have been four new developments in East Missoula, none of which asked to be annexed. I was originally told that they had to request annexation in order to get access to sewer and water, and that simply is not true. Any new home or development can hook up to city and water and is not required to be annexed. Okay, that last statement that she mentioned was actually not correct. The whole point of the having the city amenities and hookups and stuff like that is the potential for future uh, annexation from the city because those are city infrastructure items and that was usually part of the deal when actually hooking up to city water and sewer and storm water. It's one of the main principles of including those uh, areas, annexation when hooking up. The, it is a double-edged sword of city water hookups. Many public comments are concerned about the amount of infill that will exist and being able to own the properties being developed isn't a guarantee since they sell to those who buy. Uh, Jeremy Williams, real estate broker, talked about the housing crisis in the city of Missoula, and this is what he had to say for our last comment. For almost 10 years, Missoula has faced a low inventory housing crisis, and the prolonged shortage of homes has caused prices to skyrocket, affecting a residents' ability to afford homes and continue driving up prices and property taxes for everybody. To put this in perspective, there's almost 80,000 people that live in Missoula, probably closer to 100 in the surrounding areas. As of today, there's only 374 houses for all those 80,000 people. Um, in addition, more than half of those houses are over 700,000. Under 700,000, there's only two months supply of houses, which is causing prices to continue to raise up. I understand change is uncomfortable and it affects the community good and bad, no matter the situation. Uh, we have to keep in mind that there'll never be a perfect set of rules or regulations that fit every neighborhood while making the project feasible for the landowner. Variances are inevitable no matter what the project. <clears throat> Some of the most desirable neighbors, neighborhoods in Missoula have been, cre been created with variances and flexibility. Over the past 20 years, I've seen well-conceived subdivisions halted because they were not deemed fit for the area. Uh, and what seemed like a win for the neighborhood at the time ended up being a great disappointment in the future. My fear is if we don't find ways to support Missoula landowners and create positive growth, um, alternative options like building apartments, an option that doesn't have any oversight is gonna be forced upon us out of necessity. All right, so there's a lot of information coming out of this particular meeting, and I gave you the uh, the glimpse of what you guys can expect. And these arguments were common um, when the city rezoned other neighborhoods in the past for higher density and simply went back to a greater good of keeping up with Missoula growth over independent neighborhoods. However, in this case, the city did listen and put this back into committee for further discussion. And so for right now, it's still on hold and they haven't determined what they're gonna be doing moving forward uh, as you know, they're working heavily in the budget um, and they're gonna continue doing this moving forward. And of course, another quick note as I uh, wrap up my city council report. I also wanted to mention that the city is supporting a resolution in a grant application for EV charging stations to the Missoula. And during the public works meeting, this uh, CFI grant is one of the largest single grant funding opportunities for those electric vehicle charging uh, in the nation's history. And this will cover over 20% of the total $625,000 budget, leaving Missoula to fund about $125,000. And this meeting was short and it was moved on to the next item as they're continuing to uh, move forward and continue with this. And Missoula is such a great hub for a lot of places, especially for those traveling uh, cross country. And Missoula it would be a perfect place for a lot of these kind of EV charging stations to happen. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that the police held a meeting on Wednesday to take public comment on behalf of the mayor f for any citizens who faithfully use the Missoula Police Department uh, complaint process is, is not satisfied with handing, uh, of handling of those complaints. Uh, the meeting was roughly 20 minutes long and the audio was very poor considering it was coming out of the Jack Greedy room which usually has, sounds like it's a teleconference. Uh, while listening to that as well. So those are kind of like the overview of what was kind of happening this week for your city government. Uh, the budget's in full force next Monday. They'll fully pass the budget. If they don't, 
They'll move it on to uh, the next week for final consideration while they uh, try to do the budget for the fiscal year 2025, which also includes the new fire levy, which was approved uh, through the voters. And so that's a huge another uh, chunk of uh, money that would be going towards uh, city uh, staff and firefighters and more. Um, so there you go. We have plenty of show for you, and I wanted to share a nice video made by the kids of our horror camp. And without further ado, here's this. Is ready? Action. Okay. Two. Two thirty one PM. What? Western Time, January 7th, 1993. My name is Larry Sanders. This is my friend, Tom Cage, um, Peter Goldsmith, and Anthony Dravinsky. Our, we're doing our filming project for our, for our science class, for environmental, for environmental stuff. We're about to do, do our filming project soon, but we're going to lunch break we should get some uh pizza pizza yes mm -hmm. that's how exactly. you can <laughs> it. it's been six minutes since we last filmed our cameraman patrick ludwig is going to capture our friend tom yeah check cool this out hello hello watch this yeah. all right cool. do it do it Dang it, Tom. How could you miss? Do you see that down there? What's that, that down there? What is that? I don't know. He, does, he doesn't look friendly. Come on, let's go yeah, down to the I'm parking scared. lot. Uh, kind of. Come on, let's yeah. go down to the parking lot and investigate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anthony and Tom wanted to get their car you in, so... Me... I forgot your name again. And our other friend, Cooper Connor. I mean, Frank Connor is here as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You saw him too. He was right here. Yeah, he was. I don't know where he went. There's no clues or anything. You should have, like, left her here. Patrick, behind you! No. Wait, what? Wait, what? No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Nature. I, I, I think the coast is clear. Yeah, yeah, it's we're good. Oh, there it is. <laughs> but where's Frank and Patrick? It doesn't matter. They're gone. We gotta go. Guys, guys, guys. Oh, guys. We found the camera, but yeah. the other two are dead. They're dead? We couldn't find them. I don't know where they went. Yeah, we're gone. They're, they're gone, gone from the sea. We couldn't find them. Really? No, they're gone. They're dead? Dead, dead. Probably. How are they dead if you don't have any evidence that they're actually dead? If because we couldn't find them, so I don't know. That we think they're dead. I don't know. Who they're took definitely them? gone. Who killed them? Why do you ask the so many questions? Guy, man. The we, nature, we don't know who the killed them. Guy? The nature guy, yeah. He, I thought he was a legend. I grew up listening to stories around the campfire with my family about that guy. Well, clearly he's um, not because he killed our friends, and now I don't know where he went. Yeah, well, he's definitely real, and he's after us now. Yeah. Should we get out of here? We need yeah. to go. go. We gotta go, go, go. Restore. Camera rolling. Action. What are you guys doing on the computer? We're looking up this nature guy just to, we're trying to figure out what he did. Well, have you found any information about him? Yeah, we learned that he's killed a lot of people. Like how many, if you had to estimate? Like, a lot. What was that noise? Did you guys hear that? I, heard, yeah, I think it was from upstairs. I don't know. Guys, I'm, I'm going to record. Yeah, take that camera. Yeah, take that camera. Got, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. your work. Yeah, that's your work. Yeah, go record it and see what's happening. We'll, okay. keep, we'll keep researching while you're gone. Yeah, keep it posted. Please don't do anything. Uh, okay, uh, I heard the noise somewhere. It's like a big echo, I think. Uh, I heard it coming from up there. And it's really weird. No, I heard it. I think, I think, yeah, it's coming from up there. I think we should go up there. There, 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 there,
and I just heard the noise. I think it stopped now. Maybe it's up there. I don't know. Go! You guys, he's been gone for a really long time. Yeah, we've been researching for like an hour and he still hasn't come back. We should check. We should check if he's all right or not. Because we should. He shouldn't be long, gone this long. Yeah, let's yeah. go check up on him. We should definitely go check. Oh. This is where he said he wanted us to go. Uh, yeah, Anthony, you go check downstairs. All right. See if I can find Peter. Peter! I really hope Anthony can find him. Yeah. He's been missing for a while. Yes. Starting to get worried. Indeed. Hey, uh, Anthony, have you seen Peter? Um, Tom, stay here. I'm gonna check downstairs. All right, cool. And Anthony. Anthony. Where's Anthony? Where is he? Anthony. No Anthony, no Peter, no Patrick, and no Frank. Tom, you good? Tom? Tom? Where did... Where did you go, Tom? Did... You... 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 you, you no. You... No. 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 <laughs> You can't escape. <laughs> Nowhere to hide nor run. My name is Larry Sanders, and this is good morning, good evening, and good night. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this week. And I ain't talking about that movie that you just saw from our kids of horror camp. Another nature guy romp for you guys to enjoy. But let's jump right into uh, a new movie that's coming out this weekend, Alien Romulus. Welcome back to the world of space and aliens in this renewed episode of Alien franchise that goes back to its horror roots by actually being in space, where the whole prospect of in space nobody can hear you scream, you know, actually means something. Enjoy a series that has taken some liberties with each edition, but this movie promises to go back to its roots of claustrophobic spaceship where they use the HVAC system to hide and get killed by the alien. Enjoy your typical tropes like, what's going on? And to, what the heck is that? To, I don't know about that. Or, my family will, won't miss me, and my family will miss me, um, including hits like, watch out for its acid blood, and keep quiet, the alien is listening, and finally we have to kill ourselves to root out the little space rat, root and stem. They will still probably end up crashing their ship into a planet, sun, or self-destruct themselves just so they can get rid of the alien problem. That's usually what they do in most alien movies and whatever. Uh, Diddy. Not to be confused with P, uh, comes the story of a Taiwanese experience growing up in America as he acts as translator for his parents while also doing with their high expectations and trying to find a place for him to be happy. All this at the age of 13. Enjoy yet another indie darling from Sundance that will make you laugh, cry, and be pretty bored because they think some shots are very artsy-like. Um, uh, boo -boo -boo. And so he's going to learn to uh, be a skateboarder, hang out with some punk kids, and find love. And, you know, what else could a 13-year-old do in this kind of movie? Then we got another movie coming out with, uh, if Goop needed a movie, then this is the darker side of skin care. Um, hold on a second. Uh, um, and we're, of uh, the skincare business, that we are back with some movie about female mogul on her journey to be the very best that no one ever was in skincare. This one is particularly, um, 
type as she's the top dog, but bitter rivalries come to a head as Mrs. Skincare will have to fight against Ms. Skincare and those talking crap about her products as they do. Overall, this reminds me of a Curb Your Enthusiasm's Spite Store gag where someone starts a, the same business right across the street to take customers and ruin the old one in the process. Nothing heals a cut like lotion and nothing rhymes with lotion like poison. Also, if you uh, are wondering when the last time you apply lotion, you're dry and apply some already. Get out of here. Anyways, those are movies that are coming out this weekend. And up next, we have a, a new dub and stuff for you guys from the 1957 movie, uh, Kronos. Well, I'm gonna have to make some phone calls. <laughs> a lot of embarrassing phone calls I made before this was averted. Oh, yeah, and uh, another thing, I, I don't know how to say this, but you know, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I said those things last night. It was very embarrassing. You know, I honestly believe that we're all going to die. God, it's terrible. It's all right. It was the heat of the moment the whole time anyways, and I don't really believe you meant those things. Oh, uh, no. Why would, I believe, would I, why would I believe what I'm saying? It's uh, ridiculous. Indeed. Uh, so do you think I should call my cousin back at least? Uh, absolutely not. That would be... By far the worst decision you could ever make. What you said to him, you can't unsay. You said a lot of things that were in front of me, and I'm not okay with that. Oh, you're joking, right? What you said was completely and utterly unforgivable. Like, I could understand when the world was going to end, but the world is back. Freedom of speech or not, court of public opinion is going to string you up. <clears throat> forever. Mm. Sure, there's the occasional those people, but that's as hard as it goes these days. But people say it every day. Yeah, it only works for people who are below zero, and you have a reputation to uphold. This is not acceptable for what you just said out there. Well, maybe I can go on TV and apologize. Oh, no, that's not going to work. <sighs> well, well, what if you keep me on payroll and... <sighs> you just don't get it, do you? I'll just keep my head down, do my work? Oh, you think that? You think that is as easy as Operation Matchstick, where the U.S. got a bunch of Nazi scientists to do all sorts of science-y stuff over there, but this isn't the case. You're an American, first and foremost. We can't hide you like we had the Nazis. Hmm. Nothing like a little Goodwin Law to start the day. Ugh. That's only funny if people understand the context. Before we get into some of the events that are happening in and around the city of Missoula, we're going to talk a little bit about some um, news items and stuff that are affecting the city of Missoula and beyond. Um, like I said, the storm debris cleaning up is going in full force. Uh, they uh, had a schedule of cleaning up the Franklin to the Fort, Slant Streets, and River Road in that particular neighborhood this week of August the 12th. Um, things are getting kind of back to normal in Missoula as many debris are becoming a part of some of the streets and neighborhoods. And you can still request a removal by going through the city's website, missoula.co slash storm. You can also go to missoula.co slash four, the number S, to report. It's basically just missoula.co slash fours, plural, to report all down trees. Uh, Greg Jane Forte, like I said, in the top of the hour, basically said that they're going to be helping with aid of uh, $3.8 million in damages, according to the Montana Free, Rep uh, Free Press uh, website as well. Local governments will pay about 25% of local costs with the Federal Emergency Management uh, FEMA. Uh, covering about 75% of this, removing debris from the city streets and private property is going quicker than expected, as many people have taking their debris to drop-off sites throughout the last couple of weeks since the July 24th storm. And speaking of nature, because of the dry weather and hot summer, the rivers are not as high as they were going into the summer with fishing restrictions for those looking to access the river. Uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks is continuing fishing restrictions on 17 western Montana rivers, including, um, let's see, uh, the Big Hole, Bitterroot, and Jefferson are closed along the, their entire length, while other closures apply to specific segments. These are uh, per the 
hoot owl restrictions. Fishing is prohibited after 2 p.m. in many of the rivers. They're not, uh, we're paying the price for lack of snowpack over the river. And as of July 26th, most of the dozen Western Montana rivers were running below the 10th percentile, including stretches of Missouri, Clark Fork, Bitterroot, Blackfoot, and Tenton. Uh, big storms and longer distance between precipitation are on the uh, horizon as drought has become more common in Montana in the last 10 years, with extreme drought being threatened as well. Fisheries have also had to deal with the delay uh, re-entries in the greater river access with water rights becoming more necessary to hold larger populations of fish from fisheries. Fly fishing guides uh, and more have noticed folks uh, uh, preferring mornings and they have encouraged springtime fishing to offset the heat that is causing many of these issues and I don't want to go into detail of the river closures in Montana but some of the uh, uh, the dryness and some examples it just kind of here's a little map rendering of what they have posted online through the USGS um, and you're just kind of seeing these areas and if you see some of these uh, darker uh, red spots right here these are the lower drought where they have these um, uh, owl hoot kind of areas where they're trying to uh, uh, deal with the much below normal uh, areas of, of water in the rivers and stuff like that. And on that note, the fire danger has decreased as of August 5th from extreme to high, which has basically had two notches down. And we basically had a rainstorm last night with uh, lower temperatures. But many people are saying that their state's two fire restrictions were lifted, which means you can still have to note that you cannot have building, maintaining, um, attending or using a fire or campfire unless noted in the details. No smoking allowed except for enclosed vehicle or building, a developed recreational site or while stopped in an area at least three feet in diameter that is barren or clear of all flammable materials, meaning grassy areas. And as we talk uh, about some of the unsightly things happening in Missoula and access in Montana, flying into Missoula is only getting easier with major investment in Montana-based airports. According to reports through Missoula Current, Missoula, Montana has used $144 million of infrastructure money to update terminals in Montana, with Missoula getting around $3.4 million towards the Missoula International Airport. Back to Missoula with a passenger count growing year over year, the Missoula Airport crafted a new terminal plan and broke ground in 2019. It raised the portion of the old terminal and began phase two, which at roughly $75 million took several years to complete. And I did get a chance to go there last summer where I saw the terminal. I didn't actually have to walk on the tarmac and had a, a ch chance to actually go right directly into a plane through some of those terminals. The proposal is a four story, 24, oh, oh sorry, skipping too far ahead. Um, and of course you can expect to continue as flights in and out of Missoula are bound to increase with June alone being 16% more air travel and July numbers seeing similar numbers with the amount of that as well. The Montana Free Press wrote another article on the changing times of Montana centering on the growth of Lewistown or as you know, most people could get confused with Lewis 10. Uh, the proposal, uh, the proposal, proposal is a four story, 24 unit apartment complex in Lewis Town in a long vacant hillside, four blocks from Main Street, pitched out by out of town developers seeking zoning change that would allow for monolithic buildings rather than a row of mobile homes. The opposition, a uh, succession of local residents, including neighbors who prefer not to have new development looming over their backyards. Voice and concerns range from traffic to stormwater runoff. These are many arguments in towns that grow in this area. Missoula trying to create a thousand new dwelling units a year, as you are hearing from my city council report. Lewistown is just trying to keep up with the small population, feeling the increase much more. Uh, their population is more than 6,000 people, and which saw the lar largest boom from the 60s, which was at 7,400 people, which was the peak of Lewistown, and slowed over time as missile silos became scarce and unnecessary during the post-Cold War era. City and county officials interviewed by Montana Free Press in recent weeks said that they're working on a variety of efforts and effectively uh, accommodate growth, ranging from nitty-gritty land use planning to pondering broader social issues such as how to integrate new arrivals in the community's social fabric. Uh, VACOM development will bring new uh, arrivals who are enthusiastic about becoming involved in community affairs as opposed to remote workers. Um, in a town that is so small, it's hard to have a say because much of the politics remains very county-centric, and the county is roughly over 11,000 people with uh, roughly two people, two people per square mile in this whole region. So that's roughly 4,340 square miles covering around 
uh, 11,000 people in that general area, and only about 6,000 of them are in the Lewistown area. And between 300 and 400 new housing units inside the city limits, including a proposed hillside apartment building and a major redevelopment of a former sawmill site. The city commission meets about the first and third mon uh, Mondays of each month to cover very little so far. And this could be one of those things that could just be a precursor to a major boom town in the, the most centric uh, county in the state of Montana. Public land use planning is a perennial so sore spot in Montana where planning efforts must withstand both Montana's traditional detest for government intrusion on private property rights and pressure from a growth spe uh, skeptic residents. So the old pro proverb, out with the old, in with the new, isn't always about development, but population tends to be affected by growing numbers, which will see roughly 20% new faces in the community for every thousand new people. So it's unlike Missoula, which we definitely had a population boom during the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which we saw a 4,000 people to affect it. And since the pandemic, efforts have been made to reallocate the war boundaries to accommodate an even population based on the representatives. So Lewistown would need to reach about 50,000 people to be considered a city. But since they are only about 6,000 people, according to like, if you look up what is the difference between a city and, uh, you know, and towns and stuff like that, 50,000 seems to be the cutoff for most cities to have that kind of city council, city mayor. So they have like a city commission that kind of runs a lot of the city operations. And the growth and ability, availability is scarce in Montana. And many local developers are so busy that communities are getting out of state companies to build, which is why Lewistown has those kind of out of state developers being involved with this kind of stuff. Because, hey, not that many developers would be out of the 6,000 people. And if there were a developer, it'd be probably somebody who had a plan to build a couple houses on a property that they own. And that's the prospect of towns versus other people from the outside. And that's, that's it, it's weird because the rub is that community that doesn't grow, cannot last or supplement the next generation that are looking for a place to live. And if there are none available, then they have to move out of town, but have homes available that are too expensive because too many homes are being owned over the people who own them. So there are a lot of overpriced homes. Many people are too scared to actually move out of their homes. And Missoula's had already been doing with the growing pains with many dwellings are being developed, favoring density rental over single family ownership. And current housing is too expensive and many Montana legislatures might be on the chopping block as Montanans are looking for, uh, looking to the state as local communities are being put in the corner with higher taxes while Montana had that billion dollar surplus uh, this last legislation session, which kind of went nowhere, but the uh, tax rebate, which if you haven't heard about the tax rebate, it's popping now, it's going out. You guys can apply online through the Montana Revenue website. It's go online at mtrevenue.gov to the property owner. But of course, there is the uh, Montana Department of Revenue office here in the uh, city of Missoula. If you go to the one off Palmer Street, that's where the DMV is. You can't miss it double check online double check where the address is but that's general the general areas the palmer street business area is where you can find the department of the revenue you can apply there if you want to apply there some people don't want to go online and i i respect that but they also have sent out letters for people to go through the process as well and if you haven't had that kind of information i believe that they do have some more information on the website as well and i basically told everything i know about this tax rebate um, so most of it you can figure out yourself. The University of Montana also has some major developing happening within the city of Missoula and they broke ground for a 600 new unit dorm living, which I'm sure you've probably heard on the radio and on the news ad nauseum, basically saying that this is the first uh, major um, um, dorm that was proposed f here in the city of Missoula in the last 30 years. And this would be on campus living. Um, and part of this is that they're gonna plan on build this new 600 unit um, dormitory while also tearing down some of the older dorms to make room for more construction years down the road uh, up until this point. Uh, but um, <clears throat> this, this would be the, f uh, but of course, this summer, about 214 parking spots were added, which roughly offsets the number of spots that would be removed during this construction of the new residence hall. Some recent parking additions include 113 spaces of the university tennis courts and several dozen more around other parts of campus. 171,000 square feet will be the, uh, and the ticket price for this will be $70 million and will be open by fall 2027, um, unless something happens. So 
those are the kind of things that are happening in the city of Missoula and beyond in terms of just, you know, just how much things are changing for sure. There's definitely a lot of stuff going on as well. And before we know, I do about five more minutes left in my show. I do kind of want to go over some of the things that are happening within the city uh, per events. And if you're interested, Missoula Public Library is doing uh, an event well until the end of August, which is the 24th here at the library. They're doing a scavenger hunt and you can pick up a, a sheet on the second floor to start your quest. This is for kids. Follow the clues and find letters throughout the library. Once you find all the letters, solve the puzzles and receive a prize. It's a fun event for uh, kids and have a library adventure while, have, while, while at it. All right, so I'm referring to my notes, but I'm talking all over the place, so I won't get too much into this, but also the library is doing a financial literacy class. If you want to take control of your finances today at 10 a.m., this is, uh, they're doing a partnership with the International Rescue Community who has collaborated with Clearwater Credit Union to offer an ongoing financial education course. Each week will feature a new topic. And so if you miss a week, don't worry, the topics will rotate continuously. So the whole point of this is to kind of increase this uh, and to have interpretation and stuff like that. And also, and speaking of interpretation, they're gonna have uh, a form of this in Swahili, the language of Swahili, which is gonna be happening today at 10 a.m. So they'll have options for people who speak Swahili. Isn't that cool? Uh, Tiny Tales in the Park. Lowell School hosts the Tiny Tales in the Park for reading and all that kind of stuff as well. If you're interested in doing some uh, lunching, Missoula Senior Center has daily lunches Monday through Friday. But if you are also um, homeless or you know somebody is homeless, the Pavarella Center has normal breakfast, lunch, and dinners there for anybody who are struggling with food security. Missoula Food Bank is also a great resource for people who are uh, at an economic slump and who need some cheap, nutritious food moving forward. Um, let's see, let's skip ahead, let's go forward. And if you're interested in doing some um, things happening tonight, I also, let's see. <laughs> yeah, there's not much time I have left in the morning show, but I also wanted to mention that uh, Saturday, we have the farmer's market that happens every Saturday from at about 8 a.m. to about 1 p.m. It's a great way for you people to buy locally grown produce and more with baked goods, including some food trucks for a lot of people who want to get involved. It's definitely one of the things that have popped so much that uh, I get uncomfortable with the amount of people just constantly walking through the uh, <laughs> the farmer's market. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of things. River Street, um, by the Red X's, and then right in front of Thomas Marbar, especially on Pine Street with the People's Market, where you can buy some knickknacks and locally made stuff for your decor. Um, Historic Museum at, oh, I would say no, that's not it. A Montana Herbal Festival is happening this weekend as well. It's the second annual Montana Herbal Festival. It's herbal, med medicine classes, workshops, a vendor, marketplace, and more. This is uh, through the Gerald W. Marks Exploration Center in Rocky Mountain Gardens. At the Missoula Fairgrounds, there'll be three-hour herbal intensive classes, and this will be happening on Saturday and Sunday starting at 9 a.m. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, Missoula Under Construction, Fort Missoula Regional Park. Is, if you are interested in doing this, this is a $5 per person or $20 per family. This is a great way for kids to get involved and operate a forklift, bulldozer, and more. And you can visit all kinds of aw awesome builders and doers in the When I Grow Up tent, build community and support Missoula Food Bank and Community Center through this initiative. Um, let's see here. Um, Saturday, story time at the Missoula Public Library with the Paddleheads. They're doing a special thing with the baseball team here in the city of Missoula. Moon Randolph Homestead, it's a great way to learn history about the homestead. By the time this fall, they're going to be doing some apple picking happening uh, for it as well. Also on Saturday at noon, they're doing a uh, horseback harmony. And so if you haven't seen this event, this is an annual event that they do to help raise money for the Dunrovin Ranch. This is a great opportunity for artists to paint horses. So you know how people and humans do the body paint. Horses do this as well, and it's a great event that they do, and they do some photography and more and stuff like that. Um, if you're interested in learning about the Salish Kootenai language, the Salish language, art and history with Aspen Decker, Missoula Public Library uh, has a Q&A and uh, learning more about this uh, at the Missoula Public Library starting at 1 p.m., a nice presentation. Um, a couple other music events happening in those always. Uh, let's see, preparing for middle school. I also wanted to mention Missoula Public Library on Sunday from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. They're doing a class on how to prepare for middle school. This will be on the second floor of the library, uh, continuation of the Montana Herbal Festival. Home hardening workshop, and you can learn how to protect your home and outbuildings from wildfire. And this is gonna be happening, um, let's see. Oh, oops, I didn't actually get the where it is. Darn, that stinks. 
uh, Missoula and River Valley counties, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so anyways, I, I, I literally have no time, but I wanna thank you guys for joining me uh, for this morning's show. I hope you guys had a, a wonderful weekend and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramp.